This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. This is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Welcome to our traditional episode this year in which we are going to bring back Murray Sawchuck. I wish you all a Murray Christmas, and this is the eighth year that we've done this uh, with Murray. We've been talking with him about what's been going on in Las Vegas, and uh, anyhow, I I don't want to spoil too much, but there's a whole lot of stuff we talk about, uh, a lot of things that have happened, even though you'd think that during this uh, past year of uh, continuing with the lockdown, as it kind of gradually had opened, perhaps uh, that you wouldn't think a lot has happened, but there has been some stuff going on, and particularly out in Las Vegas, uh, as it's uh, opened and slowed down and opened again, and so anyhow, he's going to talk about all that and a lot more. Well, this week, I want to, again, thank you guys very much for tuning in and watching this over here on YouTube, because this is a supplement that we add to the audio podcast episodes. If you go and listen to the audio at at themagicwordpodcast.com, you'll also hear some additional content this week. Traditionally, I've been saying you need to go to YouTube to get additional content, that is to see actually the video portion of our podcast. But now I'm kind of pointing you back over to the audio portion. And the reason is I had requested people to send me their audio shout outs for the holidays of how they can say Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Festivus, whatever, for friends and family, and uh, for them to send that to me, and I will post that to then in an episode. I received them, and I posted it, so you can go and hear that then over on themagicwordpodcast.com. Just go over and check that out, and uh, listen, and subscribe to our podcast. But if you're watching this on YouTube, no problem. I'm glad that you are here, you're joining us. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel. As a matter of fact, while you're here right now, just hit subscribe. There's nothing to it. Uh, That's all you have to do. So this way that you're notified whenever we do have new videos that come out here on YouTube uh, for the Magic Word Podcast. Well, uh, again, we're going to be having another delightful conversation with uh, Murray Sawchuck here this week. And so uh, without continuing for me to talk, I'm going to let him do the talking as we introduce my guest this week, my friend and yours, the celebrity magician, Mr. Murray Sawchuck here on the Magic Word. Well, today we are speaking with uh, a friend that we get to talk with from year to year. This is our annual tradition in which we get to uh, have a conversation with celebrity magician, Mr. Murray Sawchuck. And uh, this actually is the eighth year that we've been doing this. So it, as I said, has gotten to be uh, quite a tradition. And I think it's uh, great not only to uh, hear from my friend Murray b- about what he's been up to, but also what's been happening around Las Vegas. And also just kind of a recap of what's been going on during the previous year here, there and everywhere. So please welcome my good friend, the celebrity magician. There he is, Mr. Murray Sawchuck. Hey, Murray. How you doing, buddy? You good? <laughs> I am fantastic. I could not be better uh, because we're here together right now and talking. This is great. It's so good to see you. I love your look. I feel like I need my Christmas Santa hat, though. I feel like I need to get that. Oh, oh, oh. well, I have one, but mine's just a, a little bit smaller, perhaps. Uh, so. I love it. Hang on. I've got to get my hat since you're taping this. I have to get it. So hold on. OK, uh, for those of you who are not uh, watching this on uh, YouTube, you can go and see. I've got just a, a, a very small hat. It looks like an it's a Santa hat, actually, but probably is really more of a bottle topper. if you will. <laughs> It goes on top of a, uh, a bottle of wine <laughs> there. So, and also I am wearing then my uh, Santa Claus sweater uh, here this afternoon then too. So yeah, put on your, uh, put on your festive hat. There we go, Mur. Perfect. See, I didn't realize you were dressing up for the part. So uh, <laughs> now I'm ready. I feel good. And I've got then a uh, Christmas cheer as well. Got a little, nice. uh, little martini. So cheers to you, my friend. Merry Christmas. Uh-huh. Mm. Good health. Merry Christmas. Murray Christmas, Murray Christmas, Murray Christmas, uh, and also congratulations are in order uh, for those who uh, may not know. Murray just got married a couple of months ago uh, to uh, Danny, and so congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Sawchuck. Now it's great. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, we had a great honeymoon. Just got back yesterday, so now we're back into the grind. You're my first kind of business fun thing to do, and then <laughs> a couple of days from now, we're back on stage, two shows a night getting everything going. Well, I want to talk about uh, you know that then too, but uh, going to the wedding for just a moment, I uh, had spoken to 
uh, Johnny Katz on this uh, podcast when I was actually at your home. He came over to the house and we chatted for quite a while. Uh, and he's the uh, entertainment director for the Las Vegas Review, both online and uh, in the newspaper then as well. And he had uh, said that this was the wedding of the year, the Las Vegas wedding of the year. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, it was bigger than we thought it would become. You know, you invite a few people and a few more, and then we also realize we're very fortunate to be working in Vegas yeah. and know a lot of friends right now. You know, 40 years from now, I'm sure no one will know who we are, but uh, we thought, well, let's do this up right. We got through this year and a half of, of the pandemic, you know, and I thought, well, let's do it right. And so uh, I think we had a great time. I know you were there. You looked like you had a great time. So it was phenomenal. That was I've been to a lot of weddings, but uh, and my son, Sean, was with me as well. And we both just talked about that uh, ever since. It's just been wonderful. What did you have, like about 300 people invited? Uh, yeah, we had yeah we had, well, we had over four hundred and fifty, and I think we had four hundred people there that that showed up. So and who was it that was the uh, sermon? Yeah, the efficient. Yeah, the efficient was Paul Shortino. He's the lead singer of Quiet Riot and King Cobra and a bunch of other shows. Uh, but he's he's a heavy metal rock and roll guy. Super cool. Him and his wife are wonderful people. So he he married us. Actually, I just talked to him about half an hour ago. Yeah. Now, how have you gotten to know him? How, uh, mm -hmm. We know in Vegas, we met years ago. I think they were opening up a plan of Hollywood here uh, way back in 2000. And I want to say 10, uh -huh. something like that, at 12, 10. And so we were at a red carpet and we kind of sat at the same table, kind of hit it off. And then from then on, we didn't realize we'd be such good friends, but super nice guy, um, really grateful for um, our friendship and, and his life in Vegas. And, you know, he works all the time as well. So he's a real, real great guy. And there are a lot of other people who were there who were, celebrities as among the rest of us who were non-celebrities just kind of seeing yeah, yeah. people around over there uh that and there's some people who just showed up i mean like the one fellow that who uh, apparently works at the tropicana there with you i guess he does the uh, prince tribute and he came and uh, sang a song correct yeah yeah he came in there jason tenor uh we had michael shapiro from reckless in vegas uh, we had toby bow um baldy silva from um the band toby bow with a big hit in the 70s my angel baby uh and we had everything from peter lenkovich uh lenkoff to uh who's the guy who created um hawaiian 5 and macgyver and, and magnum pi to Polly shore and flavor flave and, and a bunch of cast of crazy characters there as well we also have chris funk who's a very dear friend of mine right uh, as a magician i wasn't very many magicians there because i'm really keep my magic circle tight with my friends but um mm -hmm. but he was there and a few others you know so it was just uh yeah incredible and uh yeah i i, <clears throat> I like the fact that it, it it, did, it wasn't just a bunch of magicians. Obviously, they were your friends and family. And I, I feel like it was really a close knit group. It wasn't someone who just kind of you put out the invitation and everybody showed up kind of. I think it looked like you were selected. It was great, for an example, seeing uh, Michael Goddard there, too. It was kind of great having talked with him. You'd set me up with an, uh, a pop podcast episode we did some time ago just talking about art and uh, the crossover between the type of art he does and the kind of performing art then that we do. Uh, but, uh, you know, he got up, uh, he and Leanne, hey, Scott, good to see you. You know, it was just, uh, it was just, it was fun, 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 fun all evening long. And of course, the Zoe Bowie, uh, who was uh, the band leader and, and singer, and then was joined by the lady from the Pussycat Dolls that sang with him. Um, it was great. But, yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I say, you know, thank you. Well, and thank, thanks for being there. We had, like I said, we had a really great time. And, you know, once again, there were so many moving parts, um, but also, also realizing that me and Danny are both entertainers. We mm -hmm. orchestrated our wedding like a show, you know, it's Vegas. I mean, we were very, we would have been happy just going to Cabo San Lucas and getting married in the beach, but, but either it was going to be that or something large and big. And, and we were really glad it turned out the way it did and, uh, and really nice time. Well, now that's kind of what I was going to get to then as well. It, I assume, had been delayed a little bit due to the COVID situation of uh, not being able to, during this year, first part, we were still, as we're coming into 2021 here, uh, most of Vegas was shut down. And then slowly you kind of came back on being one, the first magician on the strip. Uh, yes. You know, to, to, to get back in. So I kind of want to, you know, talk a little bit about that, about what happened as the beginning of the year in Las Vegas and how that evolved as far as working with the CDC and what the state and city guidelines were to start opening up the city again. Well, yeah, we had to play it, you know, really uh, by ear every week and every day. You know, we got news as they knew, got news. And then we played the, the legal game of what was acceptable, you know, and I'm lucky because my show were Laugh Factory, as you know, is just me and Lefty. So it's a very small crew and staff. So we when we did open back up in November a year ago, 
um, we we're, were one of the first shows to open up because we could afford to. Our overhead wasn't very high, you know, and mm-hmm. the demand was high because there wasn't as many people here, but people wanted to see a show. So right. it was like, I think it was like, I feel like it was me and I think maybe Absinthe, the show at Caesars was open. And he had some shows down at Notoriety, a showroom downtown, and because they could space people properly, you know, mm-hmm. and not a lot of overhead. So you didn't need a lot of people to turn a profit. So, so, and of course, got through new years and then to the new year and then things changed a little more where you could, your distances could be closer to each other you didn't need this big 25 foot distance from the front of the stage to your first audience member mm-hmm. which that that killed a lot of smaller rooms in this town you know um and then also the capacities you know that's why Cirque wasn't open back then and everything else so so but we, we played the game and also the other show i'm in fantasy at the luxor um they moved to the large theater uh which is the old theater Cirque has and that wasn't being used so we moved to that theater mm-hmm. which is like a 1500 seat theater but we could have a max of 300 people in that according to the way the the six foot rule was with between people so so i was very lucky we both had sh- both shows open and then of course as you've seen the rules have been you know being looser and looser now as we get a grasp on this you know virus and, and people get vaccinated and everything else and i mean we went through a phase where there was no mask for a while and then we had to do mask again right away and now we're kind of stuck with that again right now in vegas the mask thing mm-hmm. um but right now all the shows are open and they're just rocking it you know well that's what i was going to ask about the masks then as well uh, were you allowed to not wear a mask on stage but you could not have a volunteer is that right yeah that's right i didn't have to have a mask on stage um as long as we didn't bring people up on stage so i changed my whole show to be you know audience participation but from a distance you know if i used a deck of cards it'd be a jumbo deck of cards so you could see it from a large distance away or a verbal choice if i needed somebody to pick something a name a color a word whatever it's it's all talking you know it's not right you know, or if i had a fan of cards say stop wherever you want so and ironically some of those things i've actually adapted into my show now regularly i just don't bring people up because it takes longer to get things going sure and people getting up and all this other stuff and um and i can get on with it actually a bit better now that i've kind of was forced to change a few things so right i think it kind of uh forces you to be a little bit more creative and think outside the box of what we have typically done on shows uh to start yeah. thinking this way i remember talking with alan new who had a show there in vegas and as a mentalism show you have people normally come up and help you with something well then That's you have right. to adapt a show completely and of actually pointing to people and say you know what are you thinking of or you know or right. whatever that's right yeah yeah so it was uh, a lot different. And then, as you said, the uh, uh, in, in addition, there were only so many seats that could be uh, utilized within the theater. And then they had to put, I guess, room in between each of those. Uh, and didn't you tell them, I think early on, there was uh, uh, the Cirque show because they had a large theater, but the, it went from, uh, what, 1,500 to only like 100 people or so they could seat in the theater or something? Yeah, 300 of that. May, we were allowing a capacity of 300 or 50% of the capacity or max yeah. 300 or something like that with a 25 foot distance from the stage to the first row and then spread, you know, and of course being with MGM, they're really, really cautious and they're very, very good with their, with their rules and regulations. So they even overcompensated, you know, I think we had even more than six feet between people. So, um, because, you know, you don't want to be at risk of anyone catching anything or not feeling comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. Very different from a performance point of view, because, you know, in fantasy, that's a topless review show. It's intimate. It's exciting. It's right. sensual. Well, you don't want to be in a football field for that. That doesn't really do a lot for that type right. of an intimate show, like the crazy horse from Paris or one right. of those shows. Um, so that was a little bit of a drawback yet. We still all could work. So we kind of had to give and take with all that, but we all got to work and you know, the show, we kind of learned a lot of different things about our show and, and things we do. And, and now we're back in the regular theater, mm-hmm. which holds 350 seats. Um, and it's a very intimate, you know, cabaret type theater, right. which you've seen. And everyone has a great seat in the show and we're all back to normal. The girls were wearing masks. Now we don't have to because we're all, we're all vaccinated and we're all playing by the rules and all that and, and all that stuff. We wear masks into work backstage and stuff. And then we go on stage. We don't. So, Well, I was wondering about how the audience and that is the tourists in particular were going to return to Vegas specifically. Did you notice that it seemed like once that things opened, there was just an influx of a lot of people or was it a slow trickle? Um, it's a, it's, I think it was a slow trickle, but then it really built quickly. Cause when people, 
you know, get on Instagram and social media and see things are okay. You know, as humans, we want to get out and enjoy our lives, sure, whether we know it's dangerous or not. I mean, how many people don't drive the speed limit? Why? Because they're human, you know? <laughs> um, you know, how many people do crazy stuff because they're human? They want to have fun. That's just the way we're made up. So I think with Vegas, people after a year and a half being in, they wanted somewhere to go. Couldn't leave the country, really. So, you know, you can either go to New York or la or vegas and stuff but a lot of new york and la was very very locked down they're even still pretty locked down uh whereas vegas opened up a lot quicker you know as well as mm -hmm. texas did and oklahoma and many other right. places like that you know and now, Florida. did some of the casinos also have to uh require their performers as well as employees to be vaccinated uh yeah there have been a lot of controversy about different companies or governments who have been saying well you must do this you must be vaccinated or else you're going to lose your job or whatever so was that something that you saw perhaps you working at the tropicana and again the luxor uh by two different manage is it two different management who owns those uh, is it mgm or caesars who owns what uh, mgm is owned luxor owns mgm you know or not luxor owns mgm mgm owns luxor, luxor hotel right? Right. Yeah, and they own many others, you know what I mean? Uh, Mirage and everything else, you know, and Caesars owns the other kind of world, you know okay. what I mean? Harris, but have they Harris. required their employees and performers to be vaccinated? They strongly required uh, their uh, uh, employees to be vaccinated. And it wasn't really a mandate where you're going to lose your job, but they were, they were mm. strongly suggested yeah. that, um, you know, this is something that, that should be done across the board, you know what I mean? I, I know. I got the memo and I, I got vaccinated right away, you know, cause I don't want to lose my job. You know right. what I mean? And, and I want to be safe and I want everyone else to feel safe. So, you know, so I've done a lot of things in my life that I haven't questioned and I figured, well, what the hell, you know, and then, job. and then also, of course, at the end of the show is most people go out like you uh, go out for a meet and greet. Uh, yes. Was that eliminated? And then you kind of came back or what was the status? On yeah, we, we held back meet and greets. I did meet, I did meet and greets. Um, I did meet and greets after my show with a mask. I still do. That's the requirement of Tropicana with my show there. And then when the girls do meet and greets at the Luxor, they have to wear their masks as well. So they're allowed to do meet and greets now. They just have to wear a mask, as does the audience. When they watch our show, the audiences still have to wear masks in our in our showrooms. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that was what I was going to say, too, as far as how that slowly came back. Um, have you seen some of the uh, larger shows come back? In other words, uh, is Cirque du Soleil show, you know, those are, are large shows. Are they at capacity then again? And uh, Yeah, they're all back. They're all in capacity. They're all back again. A lot of shows, though, you know, now what's happening is there's more shows than demand now. You know, before when I oh. opened in November, I was one of three shows. So we, our numbers are wonderful. We were selling out easily. And don't forget, selling out was a very small capacity in right. our room because of the spacing and all sure. that. Um, and there was no other shows and people wanted to come here and have a nice time. A lot of people thanked me for being open um, just because, you know, a lot of people were taking risks on doing things back then and uh, I wanted to work. So we did it. But um, now we have so many shows open now with big rooms and big theaters, but the capacity isn't back yet. You know, Asia's not open to come over here yet. Europe's not open yet. It's slowly being open to come over to the States, you know. Right. But but it's, you know, we probably will see the full full open Vegas probably this time next year. So they're mostly uh, domestic travelers. Not really yeah, international, exactly. obviously, who, so yeah and they've been doing that for the whole year. So now it's kind of planed off a little bit. People had some fun, came here, and now they're kind of going, okay, we've been here already. What next? You know, we're, you know, we, we like a lot of places, um, you know, want to see European visitors and Asia, visitors from Asia and everywhere else. So sure. that's been cut down. There's a lot of people not coming into this town. So well, I have heard then also that Caesars had uh, closed some venues. And so there are were actual fewer venues for a large number of magicians and other performers who were looking for places to to go and work and which was part of the issue, as I understand it, why Matt King had moved from Paris where he was, I thought they had closed that room and he had to find another place. And so he moved over to Excalibur. Is that right? That's right. Exactly. And I think he was already in talks with about moving possibly because, you know, he's been there for a long time. And as you know, hotels change what they want, who they want and their traffic and who's coming to your shows. You know, sure. I don't know all the details about the deal, but I do know that was in works before before everything happened. You know, and now mm -hmm. he's over at Excalibur, which is an MGM property, you know, doing well over there. But I, I know he used to do two shows a day at one at three o'clock. And now he's doing just one show a day. You know, I always question that because doing two shows a day yeah. in a room that holds 500 or 600 people, um, you know, uh, that's that's pretty awesome if you can sell that out. My theory is even if you're getting 150 people, uh, why not have 300 people in one show versus 150 in two shows and work twice as hard? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so but but yeah, everyone's got their own business 
platform and style. So, but now I know from what I've seen um, that he's down to one show now a day, you know, uh, which is, I think it should be in this day and age, you know, people aren't selling tickets that fast, you know, unless you're Bruno Mars or Lady Gaga, you know, or Adele. Right. Right. Um, that's a different ball game because um, you have mass appeal. But um, but in this town, you got to be a little more conservative, I think. You know what I mean? So also, you know, keep your overhead down. You know, uh, you do two shows. You got to hire staff twice a time. Ushers, union staff, all that thing. You know? Are there still a lot of people who are four walling specifically? It used to be, of course, I say way back, the, the casinos were responsible. They would hire the entertainment and everything. And they would uh, maybe they were pretty much responsible to making sure that the thing was making money. So if they're four walling something, I don't think they care as long as they are being paid and they're getting the lease or they're getting a piece of the action or whatever. My, my question is now with um, everything that has been happening, are there uh, more or less four wallers? I think right now there's, I think the same, to be honest with you, there's mm -hmm. always, there's always someone new in the block that, thinks they can make it happen. You know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think in wall street, you know, there's always another bank going, I can do just as well as Goldman and sack, you know, or Sachs or chase or whatever. Um, so I think there's always somebody, there's always a new Guinea pig, you know, and some are know what they're doing and some would just want to do it to say they've done it. You know, right. There's always somebody, there's always somebody that has enough money willing to lose it. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, so I think right. that's, you know, that's because yeah, you have to have backers. I, I know a lot yes. of times unless you have some pretty deep pockets to uh, uh, to try and fund your own show for a period of time, because as we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, you and I about how deep your pockets have to be as far as being able to make it to advertise and start putting those butts into seats before they recognize who you are. That's right. You're really nobody outside of the city limits after they don't start seeing the signs, you know, or the cab backs yeah. or anything. They don't know who you are. A hundred percent. So, so, I mean, you still have the regular shows, but you got a lot of people still four walling and trying to make it happen out there and things like that. So, mm -hmm. and this, you know, this really isn't the time to four wall in Las Vegas. It's, it's a, it is a tough market if you haven't been here for a while. And right now there's like 96 shows a night to choose from, you know, and if you're wow. new in the game and you don't have a presence outside of Vegas, meaning a really strong TV presence or uh, influencer presence or followers on online or internet, you're in trouble. You, people aren't going to know about you. And, and uh, one billboard or two isn't going to change that. That was one of the things I talked about with uh, Johnny Katz, and that is how the uh, Cirque du Soleil shows that have been the big elephants in the room have slowly gotten smaller and AGT is growing to be larger because they've got uh, like starting with Matt Franco and then of course with Shin Lim and uh, Colin Cloud now over the Luxor they have uh, the AGT show with Tommy Tan and Emily and other people who have been winners uh, over there so it seems like AGT really is growing. Yes yeah it is I mean the AGT now is got their own show at the Luxor in the big room where fantasy used to be, you know, and it's got seven or eight acts. I just saw the show a couple of weeks ago. Great show. The video mapping is phenomenal. It's just like the TV show, you know, yeah. I mean, they've had years to get it down. Right. So yeah. how are they going to screw that up? You know, and well, every they started act, that in November. Is that right? Yeah. They started that not long ago, like five weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. So November, six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty, you know, phenomenal. It's beautiful. But once again, you know, when you have that video mapping and those led walls mm -hmm. and that kind of money to put, you can make, somebody doing a vanishing cane look amazing. You know what I mean? Um, right. You can have somebody doing a floating zombie ball look amazing. Like when you have these graphics that wrap around the whole theater, it's mm -hmm. pretty phenomenal. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so that's, but there, and there's a couple acts in the show that really are phenomenal. You know, there's a few acts in the show that I thought, wow, you know, um, thank God for those LED walls and lighting. You know what I mean? I, right. you know, they're just, they're just not that good to be, um, in that show i don't think now you know because on tv you, you're always made to look really good you know what i mean of course you know in, in the um, best light possible yeah yeah or really bad one or the other but 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 you're always gonna make your acts look great so there's a lot of there's stuff that i think to the regular viewers a fan of agt it's phenomenal they're not going to see that difference or know the difference because mm -hmm. they're popular this year on tv and then once this year is done the next year will come in and they'll get rid of these acts right and bring the new acts so for agt and simon cowell it's brilliant and i and think that is a good idea yeah, yeah. it's beautiful uh, unlike what they've done again with some of the others, like with Terry Fader, you know, and then, as I said, Matt Franco and and then Shin Lim and, and Colin Cloud, who've got their own shows over there. This is kind of a rotating thing. And that's what I expected is they were going to be bringing in some different people. But the reason I brought that up is we were talking about, I guess, uh, people who know about this. And so people who come to town usually know about Circus Soleil and they know about AGT. Beyond that, they don't know any other Joe Blow. When you said you've got like, what, 98 other shows or something to, to choose from around town, you know, from downtown and Fremont to, uh, you know, every. every everywhere else. Um, 100%, 100%. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit then about some of the shows that have come or gone, uh, particularly magic shows that you might know of that uh, had happened in Vegas here this year. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, with this year asking that question because it's not a normal year. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's kind of like asking what's what's in the fridge right now mm -hmm. um, two years ago versus what's in the fridge right now after a tornado hit your house. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. You kind of, you know, <laughs> good analogy. Kind of, you know, I got a head of lettuce over here. I can use still that's still cold. I yeah. uh, cracked seven eggs. I got four eggs I can put back in the fridge, I guess. You know, so that's it's kind of an interesting question because a lot of shows that have come back, some that haven't come back. I think the real truth is by May next year, who's really still standing? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because because once this thing all happened, then the government said, hey, we're going to give you a grant if you supply, apply for this. So a lot of companies got a lot of money, you know, for this grant. So now... Yes. They got. I mean, we're talking a lot to stay, of money to stay alive, right? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, yeah. And some of it's unbelievable uh, the amount of money they got. But they now got to show every penny they've spent on whatever it is. Well, all of a sudden, I'm seeing billboard ads and airport ads for shows that we should never have a billboard ad oh. or an airport ad. Why? Because their producers, I know, have this big chunk of money that everyone knows about, and they got to get rid of it somehow because you know they got to show where they spent the money. Because if they mm -hmm. don't, they're going to be in debt for it, you know what I mean? Or whatever the case is. Right. Why not take a risk and blow the money? Because if you try to save it or put it somewhere, you're going to get, you're going to have to be taxed on it or somehow they're going to want it back. So you might as well give it a shot, blow your money through this stuff. Because there's a lot of things I've seen like that. So I was trying to figure out the first few months when I saw certain ads, I was like, how has that person got three buses wrapped <clears throat> driving down the strip mm -hmm. when Elton John doesn't have any? And I know Elton John doesn't need them, but he can afford them and right. he doesn't have them. So, so that's, you know what I mean? So that's where that question is. So now I'm understanding these companies have to get rid of some of this money because um, if they don't, you know, they, it's fraud, you know, right. so all of a sudden there's this, so there's this falsification of these shows got billboards and seven billboards and three buses and four cat, you know, 24 cab backs and all these ads. I'm thinking they should be selling out nightly. You should be selling out T-Mobile arena with 17,000 seats, mm -hmm. but it's because they got all this money and they got to filter it through. So why not? If you already got shows on the strip, whether they're making money or not, it doesn't matter. Just spend the money, give it a shot. You got to get rid of the money. It's not yours to begin with, mm -hmm. but you got an act still that you can have a show. So let's, let's put that money in and see if we can get it going. So I'm seeing a lot of that right now. So there's shows out there that are happening right now, but I, I think in about 10 months, they're not going to be here. You know because I mean? they won't have the money anymore to back it. I mean, well, no, and the money they're losing right now in their show, it doesn't really matter because they can pay. See, sure. If I got a deal with you where it's a percentage split, right? Okay. And you make a certain amount of money on, on how much you sell tickets, and that's it. Well, there's no risk to me, right? So now you've never been a risk. But if I get all this money all of a sudden, I go, I'm going to put you on a salary now, 5000 a week, Scott, okay. you'd be great. I got to get rid of this money. Yeah. And uh, you're like, okay, that's 20000 24000 a month or so I'm going to be making. But how, I got to sell that many tickets. And you know, maybe in your own head, you know, I don't know if I can sell $24,000 worth of tickets a month. Right. But your producer who has this money, because you're there, you're under their company. Right. That has a bunch of shows. Okay. Well, they go, well, you're making 5000 a week for the next six months, just so you know, enjoy it. Because I think uh, come July 1st, it's probably not going to be there. But they got to get rid of this money, right? And they've already got you as an act. They got a room that they already got your name on. You're kind of doing the deal. You may be losing money every week, but it doesn't matter because you, the company can be losing money, but as long as they got all this money from the government to pay out all these other areas, they're really not in debt, but the show's not making a cent, but they mm -hmm. do got to get rid of all this money. So I'm seeing right now with a lot of shows in Vegas, these producers that have a ton of money to get rid of, they're doing, they're doing, you know, certain shows that have like 14 acts in them. I have 18 people in the audience. These are mm -hmm. big shows with big money. I'm not going to mention the names, but they're really, so what I'm seeing now is that's what's happening right now. So everyone's got these buses and billboards and all this stuff. And then of course the billboard ads and the buses are charging up the price. Oh, really? Okay. Because, well, they haven't been in business for a year and a half. Sure. Trying to make well, money. It's like a Ponzi they... scheme, but it isn't. They're really charging this much and people are really paying this much. There's no, you know, there might be some skimming. I'm sure there is. I'm sure in 10 years, we'll see some stuff on American Greed, but, but, but their prices are up, but these, these producers can afford to pay their prices because they got half a million sitting in the bank or more because of the government grant they got given the relief mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. and they got to get rid of it. Well, because they got to get rid of it, the billboard company is now going, well, let's check the prices up because we need to recoup our costs. Right. <laughs> and, and they need to get rid of it. They, yeah. And they need to get rid of the money. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of helping everybody in a way right. because they got to get so indirectly we're falling all back into our system again. But the real thing is, 
at the end of the day, you see the show having all these billboards and ads and all this stuff. Then you go and see the show and you realize they sold 10 tickets and there's 200 people in the room. Well, they sold 10 tickets and there's 200 people in the room because they're papering because the ads aren't working to sell the act enough because they don't, nobody knows who they are. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, because they're not on TV and they're not Gordon Ramsay or Bruno Mars or Lady Gaga. Uh, but it's working in a business sense to get rid of the money, keep a show on, in Vegas, keep producers afloat be, because they still got a show to make their shows look super successful because they got all these darn ads around. And hopefully by the end of all this, and once the many, money's all spent, it'll all come down and they'll figure out which shows are really making money, which shows aren't. And I think by, well, definitely by this time next year, but I think it's going to be sooner by May next year, we'll really see the real shows that can hang and play the game still. You know, now, when you were saying that they would maybe have 200 seats filled, but only 20 of them sold, were they given comp tickets or something? Always. Or? Yeah, all the time. You know, show huh. rooms do it all the time. You can go on house seats, fill a seats. There are all these free websites that say, Scott, you're having a show, right? And say you got the um, the Houston Herald in there, or Houston Times or whatever the, the newspaper is in, in your city. Okay. The proper name of it, which I don't live there, so I don't know the name. The but, Chronicle, um, Houston Chronicle. Chronicle, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So <laughs> way off. And so, uh, so the Houston Chronicle, and you're like, Okay, but you know, it's, it's a slow night. They're, the writer's going to come in. It's a Wednesday night. I'm doing the show. You know, you only have a nice little cabaret that holds 120. We got 14 tickets sold. I got a writer. You know, whether you need, you want a full room, you want a good write up. Right. So you call every friend that you know and they get there. Well, this saves that. We can, you know, you can give 10 to 100 tickets to 1,000 tickets to house seats or seat fillers, and they will actually fill those seats for free. You don't make any money on it. They don't make any money on it, but they really do because these members who are a part of these monthly ticket clubs pay a $25 or $100 fee a month and they get to see all these shows for free. What, it does, is it good for us or not? It's not good for us as an entertainer, but it is good in the sense that say we have a slow night and we have a buyer coming or a booker, an agent, a writer. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? It makes us look like we're selling out. You know what I mean? Right. So, But when you're in the business, you know all these these things that you do to fill a room and not. So that's what I'm saying by you can have five or 10 tickets sold. But those are local people who are coming in, obviously. A lot of people are people who come to Vegas often and they know oh, that true. they know the game. You know, if I was going to Branson, Missouri, I'm sure they might have something there as well as a lot of shows, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like going to Broadway and you go to that middle ticket booth in Broadway, the red and white booth. Right. Yep, right. Half ticket. price ticks. Yeah. Yeah. And usually any show that's slow, because I don't care who you are, we've all had slow nights. They'll go Wednesday matinee, uh, Chicago. It's it's slow. Let's give them uh, let's give them two hundred tickets at thirty bucks. Let's go. We got to fill it up. You know, because right. as you know, like an airplane, once that show takes off, you'll never make money off those seats again ever. So you may rather make twenty bucks a seat versus the hundred and fifty a seat you're making because they're empty. You know, correct. And right. hopefully, maybe those people will buy a souvenir program, tell their friends, tell their friends, or, right, or buy a shirt or something. So that's the angle of it all. So yeah, wow, interesting. Yeah. Um. When people are going to see the AGT show, you said that uh, you really enjoyed it. Who was it was a standout uh, performer? Because I know they have just, uh, again, a variety there. Yeah, I mean, the clairvoyants are in it. The clairvoyants, I think, are great. They're yep. a wonderful act. Mind Tom reading Emily, right. Yeah. Um, I think they're really good. He changed his hairstyle a little bit. He combed it a bit more. Oh, the side nice curly. curly. Yeah, and I like it. I thought it looked really good. I thought he looked very good. So uh -huh. um, they were wonderful. Um, the um, the Dojo act um was there they're phenomenal both their bodies are ridiculous i mean i go to the gym a lot but i think i need to go twice as much because they look phenomenal and they're just they inspire you huh yeah duo transcend i believe they're called and they're phenomenal mm -hmm. you know preacher lawson's the host he's the um african-american comedian, comedian from agt right. very funny guy yep. um but they're getting yeah, some great acts you know i mean there's some some good acts in the show that, that were really nice so yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and so, again, some magic shows have kind of come and gone as well as other kinds of uh, shows will be interesting uh, again. Yeah. Next year to kind of see what has actually transpired and which ones uh, kind of have, have shaken out. Um, yeah. Is there uh, you get to go to a lot of shows, uh, just like I see all the time on Instagram about uh, Johnny Katz going to see all these shows of Barry Manlow and uh, Santana and everybody else and Lady Gaga and whoever is in town, basically. And you get to go to a lot of these things then as well. Have there been some shows during this past year uh, that since we've and, and I say past year, really, I guess it's been about since June or July when things kind of started to open and some of these bigger acts started to come in and not just big acts, but others that may not be as well known that you would recommend if somebody's coming to Las Vegas, like, yeah, you need to go see Barry Manilow if he's or whomever is there something like that that you've seen or yeah I mean you know Barry Manilow is back funny I brought him up and he's phenomenal I don't care what age you are if you want an education and entertainment 
I don't care if the music's your vibe or not, you know? Um, he's one of those legends like Tom Jones, like Wayne Newton, that walks on a stage and knows how to greet an audience. I mean, if you want to learn how to be a performer, I don't care whether you do magic, ventriloquism, sing, do jokes. Uh, for me, one of the greatest things in, in being a performer is knowing how to greet your audience and walk on stage. That first 20 seconds is everything. Right. Um, and it's, and a lot of people blow it every time I see it. And people have been around for years. Um, and Barry Manilow, it's a, it basically it's ed- entertainment 101. That's how you, you, know, you want to learn, take a lot of notes. I don't mean the singing. I don't care if you can sing because I can't, um, but he's funny. He knows when to speak. He knows how long he should speak for. Mm-hmm. He realizes they're not there to see him speak. <laughs> yeah. And so when he does say something, it is worthy of your listening. Yeah. He's just not rambling and, about stuff that no one really cares about except himself you know yep. so I, I do like that a lot um i mean absence is always good here in caesars um uh, it's a great show you know at caesars um david Copfield's back of course and david's always updating his show and i saw his show i think about six months ago or 10 months ago with danny my wife because she'd never seen his show and just loved it you know mm-hmm. right. he's always changing something you know that's the thing with him because of the machine that he has and, and, and the people he has behind him. Um, he can always work on stuff every day and every week and just get things better and better. Cause he's, that's, that's his passion, you know? Right. Right. So it's wonderful. Now you also have been doing a lot of traveling as well. I mean, uh, you don't just stay there at the laugh factory all the time in, in the Tropicana, but also been going different places around the country uh, and in Mexico and elsewhere to perform like one-off kind of things or different comedy clubs. We've been on, I've seen you on Instagram in Florida or wherever else. Yeah. Um, and so um, you, you get pretty good uh, crowds and whenever, how do you, how do you book yourself? I don't say book yourself. How do you, um, uh, put butts in the seats, I guess, uh, be, as being a celebrity magician. I, this is, I'm ultimately wanting to get kind of like the social media you use because each year you tend to find out what and, and give us good advice as to what's the best thing that's working for you this year. Maybe TikTok or may have before been Snapchat, whatever it happens to be. So, you know, how do you help market yourself so you make sure when you are out of town, people know you who you are to put to sell tickets? Well- yeah, it's important, I think, to always look at all facets, no matter how old you are, you know what I mean, and what you're doing. I think it's always good to try to be young again and take a risk and be scared and all that. If you don't, if you aren't scared, uh, then you're not taking enough of a risk sometimes, you know. Right. Um, and so for me, you know, I'm always looking at the next thing. I'm always looking for new TV shows, new things to do. Um, TV's always up there. You know, I just shot uh, my first one hour comedy live special. We shot here at the Plaza Hotel in the same room. Um we um we had my wedding you know uh, right. i love the plaza i love the owners there's a very dear friend of mine and the ceo jonathan and i love the room you know it's one of the right. last classic rooms in vegas and that's where I they filmed the- uh casino the movie uh, with robert de niro is that right correct they filmed many scenes uh, within that hotel and, and downtown because it had that old uh vegas vibe that's right yeah and and that's the only theater next to the flamingo that still looks like that you know what i mean that really is still and i and i really wanted that because i want that look and sometimes yes you can find those other theaters in america you know i think there's one in akron ohio and the paps theater in milwaukee is a nice one with the old ornate theaters we all have them but you know it takes a lot of work to keep those theaters running to look like that you know yeah and i love the old vibe of the old theaters and in vegas there's not that many left we just wreck things and build them again you know Whereas in <laughs> cities, the case. yeah yeah like in cities from dallas to houston and all that and you know, i think dallas has the majestic theater and a few others you know they still try to preserve them and keep them in that way and, and in vegas it's just not that way so i really wanted to film my special there and get that all the way so I, I did that so now we're in the process actually as soon as we finish here i'm getting to see the rough wrap of the edit in the studio uh, right after I'm heading out to see it for the first time. Is that going to be like a Netflix thing or something? Yeah. Netflix and Hulu and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I own it all. So I wanted to make sure I owned it all just because that way I can have the control of selling it where I want, putting it where I want. Uh, We filmed it with all the Netflix parameters, you know, that they require and and need. Um, So that's our, you know, that's where we're going with it first and Hulu and all that. Uh, But hopefully it'll be out early spring next year. Um, But it'll be just over. We shot 90 minutes, but it'll just be over an hour. So, so that's something I've been working on as well. You know, I'm always looking at pushing the envelope. Where can I go next? What can I do better or bigger? You know? Right. Right. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, and then, um, and then what else? I mean, I mean, I've read a kid, I wrote a kid's book as well, which we're illustrating right now. And that should hopefully should be out in the spring next year and as well. Called it's called at nighttime. We're all the same size. 
Okay. And it's a kid's book. And it started with my uh, rescue pup, Bailey, and how scared she was of people. And, and she was only friendly when you got on the floor with her at the same height or when you went to bed and you were the same height as her in, in the bed when she, she'd crawl up next to you. But if you were standing tall, she'd run away. So it was that whole idea. At nighttime, we're all the same size because we're all lying yeah. down. So, um, so we're working on that. So I'm always looking at that next thing, you know. Same with YouTube. We're still doing videos on that and, and TikTok as well as Facebook. Um, I'm, like I said, I did a lot of TV this last year, you know, doing cameos on CSI and I just did a Hulu commercial that came out recently. And then I've, I've shot Judge Jerry. It's Jerry Springer's new TV series. And uh, I just found out my episode's going to air January 14th on Judge Jerry. Great. And it'll, it'll be a very funny episode. This is Ellen New, uh, the m mentalist and dear friend. And it's yeah. uh, we try to sue each other, but we're dear friends, of course, as most <laughs> people know. Uh, and it, it'll be some fun TV because I'm always up for it, if you know me. So, so I'm always looking for that next thing. So for people who want an idea how to keep going out there, don't ever think you're too good for something or not good enough for something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, go and do it. Get, if, it if it's exposure and it's not going to cost you much money, do it. Um, everyone's like, oh, I don't want someone to see that. I want someone to steal something. Let them steal it. That means you're good. I mean, let them, if you're that worried about it, let them steal it. I mean, you know, you know, singers put songs out every day on the radio. A lot of times on Instagram, they'll write a song and they do this purposely. They'll put a song out acoustically with their Instagram <clears throat> and say, Hey, something I'm working on. Let me know if you like it. They'll put it out there purposely because now it date stamps the song. It date huh. stamps that they wrote it and it's theirs. Right. And I do that purposely with a lot of my stuff. I learned that from Greg Fruin years ago when he used to take full page ads out in Magic Magazine. And soon as he came up with an illusion, he put a picture of him in it in the back of the magazine, not selling it, just him, you know, saying that there's his website and I'm Greg Fruin. I love that because it date stamped it. So if anyone stole that trick, he went here, I put it in the magazine. Right. It's mine. Uh, here's the date, July, you know, 2007 or whatever it was. And I love that uh, because you can't, you know, you can patent stuff and copyright stuff, but it's so hard. But when you can date stat something, like now you have proof to go back to somebody and go, hey, stop doing it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like me with my vanishing train, you know, the illusionist. And we're talking the illusionist, meaning that whole damn cast. When they they stole my vanishing train trick, they made an appearing train. They just reversed it. And no one had ever done uh, a steam locomotive trick ever. None. I mean, uh, Dirk Arthur did one with an Amtrak train um, in a show, like a, some flat, that looked like a modern Amtrak type thing that Don Wayne and him worked on. Yeah. And Copperfield did this Orient Express thing years ago in the late eighties, early nineties on tracks outside, but no one had done everything in the little locomotive. And the only reason I did it was because of my father. But after that. And after did it indoors date, also. At, yes. And it was mine. Yeah. It was my father's train. After that date stamp in 2010, when it aired in August, there was train tricks from Danny Leary and Europe. You know, there was um, the illusionist used it because uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Brett, uh, Brett Daniels. Uh, Daniels left the show. Right. And he took his big uh, appearing. I think it was he had a stagecoach and they took that from the opening. because That's what they used to open. Right. Of course, I had just done the train thing. And then, of course, I asked all the magicians in that show from, you know, from uh, Kevin James to, to Kalen to all the guys that are friends and colleagues of mine. They're like, I didn't, I had no idea you did the train trick on America's Got Talent. I'm thinking 22 million people saw it <laughs> and you guys didn't, had no idea. There's no TVs, no internet. I'm not going to watch, you had no idea. And then one of the people went to a builder in town and asked him to build it, the train. He said, that's Murray's, you know, that's Murray's. He's like, no, Murray doesn't really have it. And he knew, I'm not going to mention any names, but he right. knew that it was mine. And also that guy knew it was mine. But of course, to this day, they still say they never knew. Well, wasn't so that one that, of the yeah. issues with America's Got Talent also saying uh, whenever they had, that was the last thing you did. You'd done a lot of things on up to a certain point, And they said Copperfield's already done that before. Wasn't that right? No, well, Copperfield put the kibosh on my train trick. So I did the train trick. And then after that, I got kicked off the, the show. And that was because Copperfield was on that year. And so was Chris Angel and a bunch of stuff. And he wasn't very happy about that. And he thought it was a copy of Hidge, which it had nothing to do with a copy of his. It wasn't even the same premise or the method or anything. It was just that I, and it wasn't even the same train. It was a locomotive. It wasn't even, he used a train car. I had a, I had a locomotive. If you know, and the thing is, my family's been in the railway for 30, 40 years. Like I have, I have a linearage to use a train, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. And, um, and uh, so I do know what I'm talking about. So it's funny that a lot of people who copied my train, they copied the same damn train. Like if you look at the illusionist, it's the same train. And if you know, and you know, railways there's probably about 120 different styles of trains they could have 
used, mm -hmm. not the one I chose, which is my dad's. Yeah. Um, and so it's very funny. So you, you run into these different things with, with various people and, you know, things happen and all this other stuff. But, but once again, my point is I always look, I look at stuff to push myself forward, get out there and, and get people to see me more in any capacity, whether it be, you know, reality shows from being on Wipeout to Judge Jerry to America's Got Talent and that, as long as people keep talking. But my point about it is that put it out there and let people know, because like I said, the train tray, I don't care how many people say um, that isn't mine. I'm like, well, then prove it. And there's not one person because everyone did it after I did it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think Kevin James said something like, it was something done in 1763 with a tram. I'm thinking, really? 1763. It was show me a picture. Well, there's no pictures then. I'm like, exactly. So I didn't copy from 1793, but it was a really good argument because, you know, once again, it's just being seen and getting out there and date stamping it. Because once you date stamp something as a magician, uh, it's yours. You know what I mean? Now people can steal if they want, but it's flattery. So what you do is you just keep creating new stuff and being ahead of the curve. You know, True. and usually people that get into my age, I'm not 20 anymore. They kind of sit back on their laurels, you know, and I've just never been one to do that. I've, you know, I love young people. I love young friends. And I also love learning from them. You know, be, even though it doesn't feel right or I'm like, oh, it's not my kind of, I don't really get it. I make sure I try to learn and get it because therefore it keeps me modern. Right, you know, right. Hip, you are new. keeping up with everything and technology and times and everything. Yeah. And speaking of uh, keeping uh, current, then also congratulations on your Genie article. You were on the cover of Genie earlier this year as well. That oh, was that's right. In 2020. Yeah, that was super nice of Richard to do that for me. And a real nice article, you know, um, written by Martin Stein, a really good friend of mine who isn't a magician, you know, uh, because, you know, I, I see some of these articles written by magicians and, and they figure right into the same magic talk. And I wanted a different story, not just magic based because, right. um, you know, we all love magic, but enough, you know, as I want to learn more about life and what you're into other than just, you know, Fred Astaire's books about dance, but there's another 12 chapters of just his life and how, who he is. And, and I love that, you know? So right. yeah, so that was a fun article and Martin's super sweet about that. And then on Vanish magazine as well, uh, they were super sweet to put me on that cover this year as well so yep. i'm very for i saw you on the cover you look great on your congratulations on your cover by the way the mum on mum that's right that's and right. Uh, november yeah, issues in as well and uh, uh that was a lot of fun and it was also kind of cool uh timing wise then as well we were able to slip in a picture there of uh, when i was at the laugh factory with you so yes you know we have been talking for such a long time saying hey you're welcome to come and be in the show sometime and uh, finally this year i was able to do that so it was so <laughs> much fun <laughs> you did great they loved you and your material was awesome as you know um but Thank but you. it was phenomenal you're always a guest at the show and it's a fun room to play you know as you know yeah. we had some pretty good audiences that week you know yeah, we did. It was yeah. uh, it was a lot of fun and you and Lefty. When you're talking about earlier about it just being a very small show and you and Lefty, that's true. I mean, it was uh, just like watching ballet in motion uh, back scenes, you know, with what Lefty was doing or, you know, you were tossing stuff and he was grabbing it or he was getting ready for the next prop or whatever was happening. I mean, it was just uh, uh, very entertaining to kind of try to keep out of the way just but I could see <laughs> what was happening. And well, people don't realize that, you know, uh, Scott, you know, you look at Penn and Teller and they just walk on stage, maybe not talk to each other. They do their bit go home, you know, or whoever is, you know, even Donnie and Marie, you know, and whatever sure. the case, me and Doug aren't a double act, even though indirectly we, we work that way in a way. Right. Um, but you don't even care top and his right hand man, which you don't see in certain people, even tape face or any of these people or Piff, you, when you work with somebody for so long, you don't realize how much you do lean on them. You know, we just did a show in Naples, Florida a week and a half ago and we were at a comedy club. So I can be more adult. I can swear a little bit, not that I swear, but, right. but you know, I can be just, I can think and say what I think and do. And I love those moments because now I'm not filtered and things can even be funnier. Right. And um, my wife flew in for, and her sister, Allie, who's seen my show lots at the Laugh Factory, but they've never seen me on the road. Also, they've seen me on TV as well. And they were like, oh my God, this is like a whole brand new show. And it wasn't it's the same crap I've been doing for 20 years, but they said it was unbelievable to see. But you were untethered, that. basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we're not in the, under the confines of a four-year-old in the front row where I can't say right. certain things or I can't go there, um, which Laugh Factory after 8.30, you can. It's a comedy club, you know? Yeah. So they were very, they were really um, excited to see that side going, oh my God, that, what a show. And I said, well, yeah. And, and they were like, now we see what Lefty does. There's no backstage there. It was just, he was off stage left, like literally just there the whole show. Right. Um, and they really appreciated what he did and, and how he worked with me and how we both worked together. Like, holy smokes, now we see how you guys work for 20 years together. And you guys you know, don't really just think, you just do it. You don't think about it. You know? And speaking of that, I thought it was kind of cool when uh, you and I were standing in the parking lot there at the Tropicana and you, it, I, 
I just felt it was a special moment. You were saying, you know, it's hard to believe that uh, here I am in Las Vegas and I'm working two shows on the strip. I'm working here and right across the street over there at the Luxor and uh, uh, and working in the fantasy show. I mean, you have had dreams come true and it's uh, due to your work ethic and uh, your drive and uh, not letting you get bogged down by things that that could pull down other people about petty things, but just kind of keep moving on and finding that next best thing. And also uh, keeping up with, uh, as I said, not only technology, but also marketing or, or business and whatever that it has to be. And uh, not afraid to get your hands dirty, quite literally, because you got a landscape company. That you were, Correct. <laughs> you're out there Correct. early in the mornings, also uh, helping somebody to uh, with their patio or something and then the afternoon working. I mean, you are just doing it all, my, my friend. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. I love to be keep busy. I love business. I love life. And I'm, I'm very fortunate, you know, I don't take anything for granted, you know, and, and uh, people always say, you know, dream it, you can do it. But people, for, they always forget that other word, you got to really work hard for it, too. And it's not always a yes, a lot of no's in the biz, you know. Well, that's true. And that's another thing is I think it's important. I was just telling somebody earlier this week that it's you should I was giving some advice of saying you should say yes as often as you can, rather than saying no or maybe or let me get back to you, that the answer is all pretty much always yes, because it will lead you to new adventures and new opportunities, right or wrong. And it may work or not, but uh, you're never going to know unless you jump in there. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yep. exactly. Yeah, I've always said that. And you know that I've known you for years, but, you know, you know me better than most. So. Yeah. Well, and I thank you for your time very much. This has been uh, great. I, 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 I know that you uh, have got someplace you were just before we got on here and you're getting ready to uh, head over to uh, someplace else then as well. And yes. uh, you're going to you have a show this afternoon. I don't. I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm actually off uh, till the 15th because in Vegas from De December 1st, the 15th is rodeo uh, week. Oh. You told and me about when that. the rodeo comes in, every cowboy takes over the town. So if you're not a topless of you show or, um, you know, or the rodeo, you or know, George Strait well. so, or somebody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So all the country guys are in town. Luke Combs, George Strait, everybody. Um, but I'm in fantasy, though, because they do well. So I'm back in fantasy on um, on Thursday. And then next week, once the Christmas rush comes in, I'm back at my show in fantasy. So, yeah, that's great. Well, listen, um, any words, any magic words you want to uh, give us here as we close out? Well, I think, you know, anybody who's wanting to do uh, and be a magician full time or you're thinking about you need a kick in the butt to, you know, get yourself going again, go take a risk, go do something different, go, go out of your, go out of your own comfort, comfort zone. zone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and try something that you said you wouldn't do. You know, I got a couple guys and I know I'm going to make it a little longer, but I got a couple of guys who are dear friends of mine and they have the capacity to, I've offered them jobs, um, at, you know, the House of Cards, who I know Joey very well over there, but they need to do 20 minutes, right? But they're acts that do six or 10 minutes. Yeah. But they've done it for all their lives. I know they can do 20 minutes. And I, I'm handing them an opportunity. I know Joey, if the person's good enough, he'll take them on for a week. If they blow it, he'll never, they'll never be back. But if they're great, mm -hmm. they got a gig. Right. And I've offered this to a couple, two or three people I know could do 20 minutes that have like eight minute acts that kill. And they say, no, I'm going, you're just killing yourself like just it's only another 12 minutes and i know it's a 12 minutes can be a long time but if you can do seven or eight minutes great then go do 10 do half an hour but don't do an hour all at once and have a crap just slowly add new great bits and after you keep doing them after a year they become this really cool bit that you'll have for the rest of your life so never give up give up take risks and work hard and uh you know and you always sleep when you're dead <laughs> Good advice from Murray, the magician. Thank you, Murray. <laughs> Thanks you, so man. much, Scott. I love you. Merry Christmas and hope to see you sooner and later, buddy. All right. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Murray Sawchuck. This is Scotty out. Well, once again, thank you very much, Murray. I appreciate you being my guest this year <laughs> again uh, on the Magic Word Podcast. Uh, it's great to catch up with you and to find out what's been going on. I hope the rest of you listeners also have enjoyed what he had to say, kind of uh, some interesting uh, uh, suggestions that he had made and some advice then as well. So again, uh, a lot of things have been happening in Las Vegas, and it'd be kind of interesting to catch up next year to see about some of these shows that are going on currently and what perhaps uh, didn't work uh, for this for this next year then as well. So I thank you guys very much for coming in and listening from week to week. I also encourage you to make sure you sign up for the pod letter so this way that you know what's happening from week to week. 
you know, who's going to be on uh, the coming week, as well as some suggestions from our archives. Again, if you just go to the magicwordpodcast.com over here, there is a little pop up that will say subscribe to our pod letter. Please do. We have over a thousand subscribers right now, and it's just a weekly update that just briefly says, here's who we have, here's who we're going to be having. As I said, some suggestions from the archives as well. And from time to time, we also have some contests that run then as well. So uh, again, go uh, check that out. And I want to thank you guys uh, for uh, coming back here this week and listening to the Magic Word Podcast. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to never give up, take risks, and work hard. This is Scotty out. <laughs>